Hey everybody, welcome to the next Ruby Hangout. Uh, joining us tonight is Aaron Patterson, also known as Tender Love. We will be very happy to talk to him in just a few minutes. Uh, tonight's moderators uh, helping out are Eric, JP, and Jim. Thanks again, guys. Uh, so the way this works is uh, Ruby Hangout is an online uh, Ruby meetup. It's really nice when you can go on uh, out to your local meetup uh, if you have one in the area, or uh, but let's say you don't, or maybe you're not feeling well, or you got other responsibilities, or whatever. So it's really uh, what we're trying to do here is create a meetup that you can come to online out of the comfort of your own home, uh, really whenever you like. I mean, we stream live uh, every the first Wednesday of every month, um, but this is all archived on YouTube, uh, so you're more than welcome to check it out later. Um, we definitely want to keep the meetup format though, so. We, uh, we want to definitely create a community here. So the ways we do that is by getting this live interaction with you out there, uh, wherever you are in your home. So that's what our moderators are here for. So as we uh, talk tonight with uh, Aaron, we're going to hope that you have questions and comments. Uh, if you do have those, uh, there are basically three ways you can get in contact uh, and get them right into our live chat. You can either use Twitter, IRC, or YouTube. So as you're watching this here on the YouTube stream, you can just leave a comment. Uh, Jim will be following that. Uh, if you want to use Twitter, just use hashtag Ruby Hangout. Uh, Eric will get your comments into our chat. And also on IRC, irc.freenode.net, uh, JP is going to be watching that in Pound Ruby Hangout. So, uh, definitely very interested in having you guys join. Um, just a quick shout out next month, we're going to be chatting with Jim Gay about DCI. Should be very interesting. Uh, but for this month, we have Aaron. So, thanks very much for joining us, Aaron. Um, Thank you for having me. For the two people who are watching who don't know who you are, do you think maybe you could uh, let them know who you are? Uh, sure. My name is Aaron. Uh, <laughs> as it says at the bottom, as it says at the bottom of my screen, my name is Aaron Patterson. Um, I'm on the Ruby core team, and I'm also on the Rails core team, and um, I tweet with at tenderlove, and I guess that's pretty much it. I I write a lot of Ruby code. Open source guy. Yes, yes. I guess I should say I work for AT and T. I'm employed as a full time open source person, so I work on open source code full time. That is my job. Senor open source developer. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that's really awesome. So, um. So how did you get into Ruby? What, what's kind of, what, what got you here to where you are? Um, I know you. I remember just watching you. I watched your closing keynote at RailsConf uh, this afternoon. And you mentioned having been a Java developer before, so commiseration. I was there too. But uh, how, how did you get into into Ruby? Well, so I, I actually started out as a my my first like paid job. I was a paid programming job. I was a Perl Perl programmer. Uh, and it actually, like, it was good. I liked being a Perl programmer. Uh, recently, though, I went back and looked at some old Perl code, and I was like, how did I, how did I ever write this? I don't even know. <laughs> anyway, I started out as a Perl program, programmer, and then, like, the dot-com crash came, and my employer was like, we're switching to Java, so you're going to be a Java programmer now, or find a new job. And I was like, okay, Java... <laughs> Java is great. <laughs> um, but basically what happened was while I was a Java programmer, I was like, okay, Perl 6 is going to happen any day. Any day Perl 6 will happen and this, <laughs> Java, this Java stuff will just go away. I can ignore it. So, I mean, I've, I've always loved, like, I was actually happy being a Perl programmer and I loved dynamic languages, so I really wanted Perl 6 to happen. And while I was a Java programmer, like somebody was like, "Hey, you should check out this Ruby Ruby programming language." And I checked it out, and I was like, "This is this." It was exactly what I hoped. Like, Perl six would be it perfectly fit my mind. Like, it worked great. I loved it. Um, and unfortunately, it actually made my job insanely depressing. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, seriously, because like I'm sitting there programming in Java all day, and I'm like, man, if this was in Ruby, I could be doing this in like two lines. <laughs> like, I'd literally be done with my job already if I was doing this in Ruby. So that's, I mean, that's kind of how I, that's how I very first got introduced to the language. 
uh, just as a general like scripting language and uh, yeah my my first major project was like, I guess major was doing like website scraping for myself pretty much. Cool. So you actually didn't get into it through Rails. You got into Ruby directly. Mm hmm Yeah, I was doing like I was doing like website scraping with it and then actually I was trying to figure out how can we use this at work and then I and then I discovered Rails and I was like, oh man, this is the best. This is awesome. Nice. So Yeah. So, so when did you get into Ruby? What were about when was that? Uh two thousand five, okay. I think. My my first gem like I looked up the date. My first gem release was in two thousand five, so it was like before then. But I'm not sure how much longer. Nice. So, I, so you're not one of those graybeard Ruby hipsters. Just like I've been doing it since like ninety six. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> two thousand. How many years is that? I guess eight years. But I don't know. Whatever. Rails was already released. <laughs> I just okay. didn't know about it. <laughs> Years PRE, we're gonna to have to talk about post Rails era or something. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> nice, nice. That's actually it's funny because I started it in Perl as well. Did Java for a while, hated it. Got Ruby in the work in the workforce. So it's I think it's um, from what I've heard, it's a pretty common pattern. But to introduce introduce Ruby into the into your job and doing it on the side and and Rails as well is what you're saying. Oh man, actually no, I like I tried to introduce it at work, but. Uh, it didn't go, like, it didn't work. Uh, so I was, like, I was super excited about it, and I, I actually gave, I gave a talk at my company, and I was like, we should use, we should use Rails. I gave them, like, a super simple demo, and I actually got it working. So this is crazy. I actually got it working against our um, Oracle database, and, and, I mean, this was, like, I know this is before 1.0. It was, like, 09-something. I actually got it working against our Oracle database, and I got it working against. Um, I don't. I don't really want to go into it too much, but we had basically a database that was like completely proprietary. Oh wow! Like, just, just trust me that it was stupid. Like Believe me that. <laughs> no. Well, okay. So what it was, I don't know why. I can't justify it. It was like it was basically. It was an Apache an Apache module that um, that made requests to a MySQL database, and basically what you're supposed to do is you and it had you'd send a SQL query to this Apache module and it would return to you the result set from the MySQL database in CSV. I don't know why we had this; we just did, and like. I was actually able to write an active record adapter to work against this crazy, crazy thing. So I demoed it. I demoed it at the company, and um, oh man, the senior senior architect guy got super upset with me, and he was like, "We'll never use this. This will never be used. Why are you showing this to us? Like, this is a complete waste of time." And I'm like, "Whoa, dude! Wow." <laughs> You don't have to use it if you don't want to. It's just a thing I think is cool. <laughs> so, funny. yeah, it didn't go. It didn't go over very well. Um, but actually, like maybe I don't know. A few months after that, I quit my job there for a small, like a small startup doing rail stuff. And that's how, like, that's how I got my first paid job doing doing Ruby was at a startup. So nice. That's yeah. Awesome. That's awesome. So, but you were using um, Mechanize for yourself, and that's kind of what kicked it off. You said. Yep. Yeah, pretty much. I was writing a. So, I guess I should tell the story. It's pretty funny. I was writing a. <laughs> uh, yes, it was 2005, December, because it was my birthday, and um, there was a Lord of the Rings trilogy. Uh huh. And I wanted to see all three, like all three of them were playing on one day, and I wanted to purchase tickets. So I wrote this thing in Mechanized, like go scrape the ticket purchasing website. And the reason I did that is because the ticket purchasing website was breaking. It didn't work. Like they opened it at like a certain time, and of course everybody came in. And, you know, 2005, we didn't have um, MongoDB yet, so nobody knew how to scale anything. <laughs> of course. <laughs> 
So, <laughs> um, anyway, anyway, like, so what I did is I, like, in between, in between compiling our application, or while I was compiling our application at work, the 10-minute compilation time, I was writing a script to go scrape their website, and, like, I had it put in my credit card number and everything, because, like, you know, I need to buy these tickets. And I had it just basically in a loop, and I logged the output, and I was like, okay, if the output ever changes, then I'll go check it out. Because I knew, I knew what the failures looked like, but I didn't know what the, you know, what the success conditions looked like. So I just let it loop, and then, you know, I kind of forgot what was going on. And then I go look at it later, and I see in the logs, like, the logs have changed, and I'm like, okay, the logs have changed. What's going on? So I go walk through the process in the browser, and I'm like, oh, no. It's been working. <laughs> and I didn't know to shut it off, so I had no idea. I had no idea. It kept, like, it kept, like buying tickets over and over again. <laughs> I think it's the only time I've heard of anybody being upset when their script worked. Yes, yeah, so I called, well, I, I'm like, okay, okay, how many times has it done this? So I called up the credit card company, and I was like, okay, how many charges have been on my credit card today? <laughs> <laughs> Which, I mean, if you think about it, it's a totally shady question to ask because it's like, shouldn't you know how many charges are on your yeah. credit card today? <laughs> and the, the credit, they were like, oh, there's there's been only one charge, and I'm like, oh, that's great, okay. So then I called up the I called up the uh, the ticketing company, and I was like, hey, um, how many tickets have I bought from you guys today? <laughs> <laughs> and they somehow they had records of it, and the guy goes to the records, and he's like, "Yeah, you've only bought, you know, you've only bought two tickets, but it looks like we've char tried to charge your card hundreds of times." <laughs> and I was like, "I was like, oh, I just kept hitting refresh on your page. I didn't, I didn't know what was going on." <laughs> so like. That was like that was like my first major major mechanized. Story. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So, yeah, I was I was extremely worried at the time, but I mean, it, it's okay. And I got to go see all three movies. I sat in a movie theater for twelve hours. It's kind of crazy. That is crazy. So they were the extended versions. <laughs> Yeah, the first two, the first two were the extended versions, and then they had like they hadn't released the extended version for the third one. We just watched the third one. It was wow. pretty fun. It was pretty fun, except that um, you know it was kind of rainy in Seattle, so like I was sitting in this giant movie theater with a lot, and the seats were first come, first serve, so it was a lot of very wet nerds in a the theater. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm sure that's I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I had an awesome time. It was amazing. I had a really good time. But <laughs> <laughs> I had actually there were a lot of so there are a lot of people there who are like very serious about Lord of the Rings. Oh, I bet. And I like I bought a um, I bought a like a seat cover, basically a. Or a uh, I won't mince words here. It was a hemorrhoid ring. <laughs> <laughs> and I painted it gold, and then I wrote on it um, w the one ring, and then <laughs> I, like, I wore it while I was in line. <laughs> and I got like so many dirty looks. It was like... But then, but but I mean, it came in really handy because I was sitting in this theater for like twelve hours. It's actually I had I had the most comfortable seat in the house. I yeah. guarantee. So there you go. Whatever. Anyway, <laughs> I know we're getting we're getting off the uh, programming topic here. I don't know, man. This is all thinking like a programmer to me. <laughs> <laughs> you just would have never been in that seat with, if it weren't for the power of Ruby. Isn't that true? No, no, absolutely not. <laughs> if it weren't for Ruby, I would not I would not have been there. Of course, then like. I was looking at I was looking at uh, people who were selling the tickets on eBay afterwards, and they were selling them for like three hundred fifty, four hundred dollars each. And I was like, "Dang, I wish my program had actually bought a whole bunch of tickets." <laughs> nice. Uh, <laughs> so that's awesome. That's awesome. So that was, I assume, before Nokogiri. 
Yeah, that was. I wrote so I wrote Nokogiri when I was at the uh, startup company I worked for. Uh, we did a lot of so I did it for two reasons. Basically, like we did a lot of XML processing, uh, and the XML parser we were using was very slow. And then also, I guess actually there was various reasons. We did XML parsing. Um, Mechanize used. Uh, uh, an XML parser for processing the HTML that comes in, um, and it was very slow. So I wanted to replace it with something, uh, and also I really hated my job, and I needed a way to escape it. So mm -hmm. I would write. I that XML wasn't a lot of fun, huh? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> pretty much. The thing is, like, you think going and working for a startup company would be super amazing, but. This was not a very fun job. I mean, I was working in, so I was working in online advertising, and it was like, just, I don't know. I mean, I was working with Ruby, which was really exciting, and I was really happy about it. It was kind of weird, like, it was kind of a weird time, because I think, like, there was a point, if you think about this, like, there was a point when everybody who had a, a job coding in Ruby, like, they were super excited, because they had a job programming in Ruby. Yeah. But now, like, now, if you think about it today, there are absolutely people out there who are like, uh, I don't like, I have to code Ruby all day. Like, you have to do it. And, I mean, I kind of felt that way at this job, except that I didn't like the job because of what it was, but I love, like, the only saving grace was that I was like, I'm a Ruby programmer, and I love this language. So, yeah. yeah. It was before the days of we need all the Ruby ninjas, pirates. Little yeah. Little yep, little it was. <laughs> yeah, it was, and actually, it actually kind of sucked because, like, I mean, I was getting, I was, I was getting paid a nice Java salary before I became a Ruby programmer, and they did Ruby programmers did not have Java salaries. <laughs> it's true. Now they have two X Java salaries. <laughs> if you're only if you're a ninja, only if you've had ninja training. I haven't gone like I haven't gone through that program yet. I never graduated college, so I don't have ninja <laughs> ninja. You didn't graduate the Pirate Academy first? No. <laughs> so clearly you've done pretty well. Uh, you're on the core team of both Ruby and Rails, and I think that's a pretty high achievement. So how did you get onto those core teams if you don't know how to program? Clearly you have a degree. <laughs> oh, that actually turned out to be my main asset, not knowing how to program. Oh, oh, of course. <laughs> How else do you level scale? <laughs> uh, so, what came first? Uh, um, I can't remember. I can't remember which one came first. Oh no, 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 it was Ruby. I was on the Ruby core team before I was on the Rails core team. Okay. Um, I joined the I joined the Ruby core team. I I guess it's kind of a sad story. Um, kind of. Uh -huh. I guess. Uh, maybe happy ending. So I joined the Ruby core team after um, after Y left us. And I joined because I basically picked up um, his stuff. So I picked up maintenance of some of the stuff that he had in Ruby core. And I also picked up maintenance of like some other minor libraries in, in Ruby core. But basically the way I did it was just like keep fixing bugs like fix bugs and submit, you know, submit patches and stuff. Um, and I mean, it wasn't too like it wasn't too difficult. The hard part was figuring out how to like compile. Like, actually, no, that's not true. Figuring out how to compile was easy. Figuring out how to run the tests was ridiculous. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's, you, you have to do like you have to do a special make command. You have to do like make and pass it an environment variable and do this stuff. If you don't pass it the environment variable, it runs all the tests and those take forever. So, like, that was the hard part. Uh, but actually, I mean, I probably only sent maybe a dozen patches before I joined the Ruby core team. That's, that's not very many. No. Rails core team was much more difficult. Uh, I actually, like, Basically, what I did there was I had to keep sending pull requests until uh, Jeremy got tired of applying 
four quests. <laughs> and then even that, even then, I still wasn't part of the core team. I was put onto the committers committers list. I think I was on the committers list for like a year at least. <laughs> and like, I'm pretty sure I had maybe. I'm just guessing maybe eight or nine hundred commits before I became the core team member. Wow. That's so, a lot. Yeah, well, I, the thing is, like, it's, I don't actually know what the difference is between a committer and a core team member on the Rails team is. Like, I guess, like, I don't know. Uh, you get heard in discussions, maybe. <laughs> I guess. I mean, but we all, like, we all talk to committers. It's not like, I don't think any, you know, as far as I can tell, it's just experience. But, um, okay. well, I, I mean, don't think... I assume it's good to have a, sort of a canon of people who are, you know, trusted. It's kind of like the, the Linux kernel team. I mean, there are, there's Linus, obviously, and then his lieutenants who are, you know, trusted. Yeah. So, I, we assume... Also, like, the other weird thing is, is Ruby Core, I mean, Ruby, the Ruby Core team is anybody basically who has commit access to Ruby is on the, on the core team, and I think there is something like 25 people on the Ruby Core team. Wow. Uh, whereas that's not the case with Rails. You know, Rails has committers and the core team members. And I think we only have, I'm guessing, 12 committers, I think, 12 committers total, maybe, wow. a, maybe a few more. Um, but then there's, I think, maybe eight on the core team. I don't remember. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't really kept up with it too much. I don't know. I don't know. So one thing I'm curious about, I mean, you speak Japanese, don't you? Um, do you yes. think that was really helpful or, I mean, required helpful for whatever, for getting on the MRI team at all? Uh, I mean, so... It depends. It depends on what you're trying to do. If you're just trying to like contribute patches and stuff, no, you don't like. Definitely not required. Not even helpful at all, really. Like everybody on the core team speaks English. It's just, I mean, you just have to be understanding. Like any open source project, you know, there's international international people where English is their second language, you know. Um, but. It's good in terms of speaking Japanese. Is good in terms of, uh, oh, when I when I go to Japan or go to Ruby Kaigi or whatever, and I want to communicate, like I want to communicate with them with the Japanese team members. Um, it's good because it helps with. Uh, I mean, it just helps with the language barrier, right? Most of most of the team English is their second language, and. It makes the conversation smoother if it's like, okay, you don't know how, you don't know how to say this in English, try Japanese, and then we can like move the conversation forward. So it's helpful. It's mainly helpful when you're in person, really. I see. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I was just in uh, Costa Rica for vacation. Nice to take a vacation, um, but being able to speak Spanish was very helpful. And I, I, I'm sure it's very similar. I mean, they, they, the people there spoke English. Uh, mostly, but it's you know there's a disconnect, and so I assume that's what you're talking about. Yeah, it's nice when you're a person. The, the advantage with email is that like you have dictionary there. Yes. <laughs> you're like, okay, diction I don't know what to say. Dictionary. <laughs> nice, nice. That's cool. So, um, and then how is the? I mean, the, how does the communication really work on the on the various uh, teams? Like. You kind of have a nice like view because you're on both, and you can kind of see how they work differently. I mean, um, I mean, in general, open source communication I think is a big issue when you're trying to coordinate various things. Um, so it'd be I'd be curious to hear like how the two teams work. So um, <clears throat> Ruby Core has. So I'll, I'll talk about Ruby Core then Rails. Um, Ruby Core has. We just communicate over the mailing list basically, but. We've been trying to do, and I kind of suck. This is my fault. Uh, we've been trying to do IRC, IRC meetings, but basically I'm the only one that coordinates that. If I don't, like, if, if nobody coordinates it, then it doesn't happen. But I want, like, I really want the Ruby Core team to be meeting in person, or, well, not in person, but, you know, like, 
real in real time. Yeah. Uh, I want them to be meeting in real time with other Ruby implementers, uh, but if nobody does the coordination for the meeting, then it doesn't happen. So I've been trying to do it, um, but I travel a lot, so I've been falling down on that lately. But we're actually having one uh, Friday, so uh, yeah. So there's that, and then there's that, and then we communicate via the mailing list. Um, the Ruby Core mailing list, and there's actually there's actually a Japanese mailing list. I'm on the Japanese mailing list as well, mm -hmm. um, but I think people get paranoid about the Japanese mailing list because when you read like as an English speaker, Japanese is very uh, I don't know like impenetrable, right? You look yeah. at, it's like a fortress. You've got this fortress of text in front of you. You have no idea what it says, right? Yeah. So it's like you look at the Japanese list and you're like, what are they talking about? I, why is you know what's going on? Um, Do you use the full kanji on the list. Oh yeah, every like oh, I wow. mean, so what it is is um, I mean typically people are just talking about bug fixes. Anytime there's like a major thing, it all happens like it all happens in English. So I mean, if you're afraid of you know if you're concerned about what's happening on the Japanese list, I promise you that it is 99% incredibly boring. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, yeah, the, so basically that's how that's how Ruby Core communicates and we use we have a bug tracker too and like actually one thing I like about Ruby Core is we have a deadline. So we have a deadline. Actually there's a deadline for Ruby 2.1 coming up. So if you have features that you want in Ruby 2.1, please pay attention to the core mailing list now. Um, and Look at the mailing list. We're discussing those. Uh, anyway, all the features have to be completed by the deadline. Basically, if they don't make it in by the deadline, then the feature is not in. It's just not in. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, we can just push it out to the next release or whatever. Where with Rails, we don't ever have a hard deadline. It's always like, eh, it's done when it's done. And. So like, actually this happened to me. We've been talking about the release of Rails 4 for quite a while, right? And I wanted to have, um, wanted to have a queuing API in there. And uh, we talked about it, we had it in master, and then we were like, basically we were discussing, you know, discussing API issues, running across different problems, just trying to solve problems with it. And we were saying, well, you know, like, this is like we can't release Rails four because we have all these unanswered questions. And I was like, you know, it doesn't matter if it's if this is what's blocking us from releasing Rails four. I'd rather just push the feature off to the next version, right? Mm -hmm. Let's just like just postpone it. Let's cut Rails four now, and then we buy ourselves, you know, buy ourselves all the time we need to figure out to iron out the problems. Now, unfortunately. This happened in September of last year. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, September, I was like, oh man, you know, we're gonna release like right away. This will be out. Like, we'll be done. But then, you know, <laughs> September, October, November, and I, you know, until now, finally it's out. So yeah. <laughs> uh, we never have like we don't really have any deadlines with Rails and that I mean in some aspects there are some, you know, I think I've, that bothers me somewhat sometimes. Yeah. You yeah. Know? We're actually discussing that at our, at our office right now, like the value of having hard deadlines, even if they're artificial. Like, I don't know. It could be really a different mindset kind of thing. I think. Yeah. I. I mean, I like. I like the idea of. I see the advantages of both sides. You know, like having it's done when it's done is good because then you can make sure it's polished, right? Mm -hmm. But you're never going to ship. Like, if you think about it from the pragmatic side, you're never going to ship bug-free code. It's impossible, mm -hmm. right? And if you have something that you know has bugs in it, well, you can just defer it until the next release. Just say, okay, we'll just wait, you know, we'll just wait until the next release. So, eh, it's hard to say, it's hard to say which one is better necessarily. I think, yeah. um, I, I like the deadlines, but, you know, I'm not in charge, so. Yeah. 
So you are paid by AT&T to work on open source. Yes, I am. Sounds like a pretty sweet gig. It is nice, yes. I like it. I like my job. <laughs> so thank you, AT&T, for supporting open source. Yes, definitely. It's funny when I get emails from recruiters. <laughs> like, you want me to do what? <laughs> I <laughs> come be a, come be a ninja for us. Like nah, <laughs> nah, I'm fine. Thanks. I think you and Steve Klavnik are the only people I know who uh, get paid to write <laughs> course. And I Mast guess us. Well, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a, I, mean, I think it's a really great service. Uh, I'm a firm believer in open source myself. So, in in each of these, in both of the departments, I want to understand better what it is you work on typically. Um, and actually, Will Howard was just asking on YouTube, what is it you focus on on, on Ruby specifically first? Um, well, specifically, what I focus on in Ruby, I mean, it depends. It depends. Basically, when we need stuff, if there's any stuff that we need in Rails, then I'll try to focus on something like that. Like, for example, we got a thing added so that you could do constant lookups by fully qualified names, which is something that we needed in Rails. So basically what I try to do is find things like find things like that to make our lives easier and push for it. Uh, one thing I'm working on now is like uh, we want to do uh, especially web servers need this. Well actually any anything that does socket uh, socket communications is like we want to be able to do non-blocking reads, but we want to be able to do those without using an exception. So basically, the way non-blocking read typically works is you say, like, OK, read some data off of this socket um, and don't block. But if it was going to block, then the way that it tells you it was going to block is it raises an exception. right? And so what you're supposed to do is catch that exception and then retry. Mm -hmm. right? So you're basically forming a loop that way. You say like, okay, read some stuff, catch the exception, retry the retry the beginning, and you keep doing that over and over again. But it's kind of awkward because you're forming a loop. It's technically a loop, right? Mm -hmm. But you're not using a loop con construct. You're using an exception and a retry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is weird. To form a loop, and then the other weird thing is that it's common for um, a non-blocking read to say like, I need to, you know. I need to block, or I need I would block. That's a common thing to do. So having an exception, it's not an exceptional case. Sure. Right. Yeah. So one of the things I'm working on now is uh, trying to get an API into into Ruby that will let us do non-blocking reads that don't have exceptions. So you can say like, okay, read some stuff, check the return value. Was it you know, was it going to block? If it was, let's retry. If it didn't block, then grab our data and move on with our lives. So uh, just like finding that lower level type stuff is you know, basically what I look for in Ruby, changes, changes that we make to Ruby. And I mean, obviously, those things don't happen as frequently as changes to Rails. Mm -hmm. So I mean, since Rails is a much higher level than the stuff we need in Ruby. Right, right. But again, you said that those are features driven by the needs of Rails primarily. Yes. So, what well, does the, the non blocking thing affect Rails, for example? <clears throat> well, it won't affect Rails too much. What it'll affect is it'll affect uh, web servers. Okay. So, web servers is what we'll use this, which indirectly affects Rails. I mean, need a web server for Rails. <laughs> True. So yeah, so that'll mostly clean up their API, I guess, internally. Yes. Yep. Nice. I mean, most of the stuff, probably the stuff that I try to contribute to Ruby is hopefully stuff you won't ever have to touch. <laughs> hopefully. So that you don't have to worry about people yelling at you about it, right? <laughs> yes. Exactly. <laughs> yes. How about so, Rails? Yeah. What do you tend to focus on on Rails? Well, that also, I mean. The way I find stuff to work on with Rails is typically like I'll take the apps that we use at work. So I guess I should explain the way I, I work on my team. Um, I am a support person, basically. Uh -huh. So I'm on a team of I'm on a team of other Rails devs, and 
I'm basically like tier one support, I guess. <laughs> They're like, I have a bug. How do I, fi you know, what do I do? And then I help them out, like help them out and fix that. Or, oh, this is actually a bug. And then, I mean, since AT and T pays me, obviously our bugs get. So you're like you're, one, you're like they're supposed to contract for Ruby and Rails, essentially. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, if we have a bug, if AT and T employees have a bug, it's like okay, boom, nice. we we get those solved, right? <laughs> uh, so beyond that, what I look for is I look for uh, basically bottlenecks in our applications and how how like I can change the framework such that it'll improve, say, the memory profile or the speed profile of the applications we have at work. Nice. Um, I don't do too much on the side of, like, um, new APIs necessarily. I mean, sometimes, like, sometimes I'll put in new APIs to Rails, but where, only, where, like, only where it makes sense. Like, basically, APIs that come out of refactoring what we have currently, but, like, I never come up with stuff like, oh, we need number 42 on inactive support. <laughs> yeah. Something. 42nd, like, that's I'm not that kind of guy. Like, yeah. I think we have enough APIs in Rails already. <laughs> so you're one of those people making the, the discourse team happier about their choice of Rails. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Exactly. Awesome. Yeah. I, I wanted to inject here. Tony Arcieri brings up something about IO wait retrieval, uh, blowing out your method cache. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, IO wait retrieval blows out your method cache because wait readable, it, sorry, not yes. readable and wait, wait writable. Uh, yeah, actually, is there is the question in here? Yeah, it is. Last one. Tony, blah, 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 blah. Yep, that's true. He's he's just making a point. So basically what happens is when you whenever that exception gets raised, so it's even worse. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk about what happens. When it rates, when um, a non-blocking read raises an exception, first off, you have the problem of building an exception, so like you have to construct an exception object, and you have to construct a backtrace. Doing all this stuff is not necessarily cheap. Oh, right? yeah. mm -hmm. And then on top of that, um, MRI mixes a, like as soon as that thing is raised, it actually creates the object and then mixes in a module onto the exception object, which is what Tony is talking about. Uh, and whenever um, MRI does an ex it's basically if you were to write it out in Ruby it would be like exception object dot extend module oh. right and whenever you do that it breaks the method caches in Ruby and then like you have to recalculate recalculate all the uh, method caches so but we're all using DCI anyway so we don't care right because <laughs> <laughs> your method cache is broken all the time there's exactly. no method cache yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so actually, I I believe I was chatting with Charles about this the other day, and I believe that what Tony is talking about is actually fixed in Trunk. I think it is. Uh, uh, so now it's only it's still very expensive to do that, or it's still very expensive to build up this exception object every time. It's just less expensive, I guess. Nice, nice. Speaking so, of guys, is there anything going on in the in the Ruby core team to help with the method cache problems that DCI brings up? Uh, hmm. well, I know Charlie Charlie Somerville has been looking at. He's been doing some patches that look very interesting. Basically, stealing the uh, stealing the algorithms that JRuby uses for its cache busting mechanisms. Mm -hmm. uh, so that might help some. Um, but it really depends, like, I don't know, if you're using DCI all over the place, everywhere, then I don't know if there's much you can do about it. <laughs> so, the other thing, I mean, so honestly, like, I don't see what DCI solves that a, pro a proxy object couldn't solve. And if you use a proxy object, then you get your method cache. So, yeah, I, I, I like... I'm not convinced it's a problem that needs to be solved. Fair enough. I actually know uh, Jim Gay is working on uh, a gem that kind of eliminates the problem anyway, just a better pattern for it. Ah, uh, that's cool. Yeah, a better pattern that doesn't that doesn't break method caches, hopefully. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember the details of how he's making it work, but he's got something in there. Awesome, awesome. That's great. 
So um, you mentioned J Ruby briefly, um, and aside from MRI, um, Chris uh, Sinjo actually was asking, what um, other Ruby implementations are you really excited by? Um, well, J Ruby excites me. Uh, Rubinius excites me a lot. Um, and the reason it excites me, well, one of the main reasons it excites me is because um, it proves. Basically, Rubinius proves that you can have a generational compacting garbage collector and still maintain C compatibility, for the most part, right? Which basically gives me hope that um, one day MRI will have a uh, generational compacting garbage collector. So that's like one of the main reasons it really excites me. Nice. So that actually brings up um, the the fact that MRI is written in C. Um, you never mentioned C before when we were talking about your background. <laughs> I'm a C hacker. <laughs> is that something you had to pick up on your own to, to start trying to contribute to it? And how hard was that? Or how'd that go? Um, I was, I've, I've actually been doing C almost all of my programming career. Um, like we would do, we had even back in the Perl days, we had some C stuff. Like, we had Apache modules written in C. Um, I guess I've been doing C for a really long time. Uh, but, yeah, like, definitely picking up C is... I mean, you don't have to... There's a lot of stuff in Ruby that's written in Ruby, but um, if you really want to make major contributions, probably learning C would be a good thing. And then how complex is the C code base? I mean, is it really pretty dense or impenetrable or easy? Um, actually, okay. Did you Have you ever written any XS code in Perl? Uh, I actually had not. Okay, so it's the worst thing in the entire world. <laughs> <laughs> MRI's C code, C API is much better. <laughs> <laughs> That's not saying a whole lot. <laughs> no, it's, no, it's not really. Uh, it's actually... I don't know. The C the C code is actually pretty easy um, once you get the hang of it. It's mostly like it actually follows a Ruby pretty care pretty closely. The only time it gets kind of crazy is if you need to look at um, oh I'm trying to think of the craziest parts I've looked at. Eh, probably dealing with threads. Um, I guess I'd say probably dealing with threads is the hardest part. Um, beyond that, it's not too. It's not really too bad. I mean, the thing that sucks about C is like, it's so much more verbose than. Um, well, besides having to manage your own memory, the other things that suck about C is that it's too verbose. Like you could be writing the same thing in Ruby in much fewer lines. Mm -hmm. So that's the only thing that really sucks is you have to read through a lot of code before you can understand understand how the stuff works. But it's really, I mean, I think MRI is pretty well organized. So, and it's not too hard to get around. Like, if you want to know how are objects defined, or how do objects work, well, you look at object.c. Or how do threads work, you look at thread.c. I mean, it's, it's not too bad. Cool. Well, that gives me hope for uh, my joining the core team at one point. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please do. So, um... Actually, while we're deep into uh, Ruby here, uh, Saul Goldman asks a question, um, and he's kind of, I think, referencing some of the D-Trace stuff you've done. Uh, he was wondering if there's more to learn from the D-Trace probes that you've done with regards to, to Ruby and Rails performance, and is this something you're planning to spend more time on? Uh, is there s more stuff to be learned? Um, I mean, there's always stuff to be learned from it. Like, I use it... I use it pretty frequently if we're doing profiling profiling on Rails. Um, and yeah, I think we're going to be modifying the D-Trace probe somewhat. Um, Nadi, the garbage collector maintainer, or Ruby's garbage collector maintainer, has been asking for some stuff in it, like specifically passing object IDs and stuff. So I think we might be getting some more, um, I guess, better integration as far as like memory management is concerned. Um, what was the other part of the question? Something about oh, Rails? 
Uh, yeah, are you working on improving performance of, of Ruby and Rails using Ptrace, I guess? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, that's, like, basically what I use it for. That's pretty much the only thing I use it for is profiling, profiling Rails. Um, is that something use... you're actively into right now, or is it kind of like you get back to it once in a while? Um, I get back to it, I get back to it once in a while. The thing is, like, you go between... I found that I go between things like, um, well, as far as performance improvements are concerned, I go between things like, um, so basically I use those D-trace probes and stuff to find where our bottlenecks are, and from that I go into possibly adjusting algorithms. So I mean, you can look at, like, maybe you find, like, okay, we have this little hot spot. You have a hot spot, and like, okay, use a D-trace probes, you find that, you find the hot spot, and you think, well, okay, I can reduce, I don't know, you know, maybe make the loop smaller, or do fewer method calls, or something like that. But then, like, you start thinking about it a little bit, and you're like, well, why, you know, why am I doing so much? Or why am I, why am I doing this? And then, as soon as you start thinking about it from a higher level, then you start thinking about the algorithms that are involved, and uh, changing those algorithms, like Dtrace can't really teach you anything about the algorithm. Like it teaches you about the hotspots, but you don't understand, like it doesn't teach you what the algorithms are necessarily. So I go in between these waves of like, okay, finding hotspots and adjusting algorithms, right? So when I'm finding hotspots, I'll be heavily using Dtrace probes. And when I'm adjusting algorithms, I probably won't touch them at all because I just need to look at changing the Ruby code. So right now I'm on the right now I'm on the um, uh, adjusting algorithm stuff. So yes, I'm actually I'm working on some new caching stuff for Rails. I'm pretty excited about it. Cool. So I'm, uh, sorry, looks like we're breaking up a little bit. Uh, hope we didn't lose you. I'm here. Oh, all right. Just video is being choppy right now. Normally, Hangouts are pretty clear. Oh, well. Um, it's probably my sorry. internet. Yeah, I don't know. I think Eric's breaking up a little bit, too, so it might just ah. be... Yeah. So, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I kind of missed what you were saying. Maybe. Is it hashing or caching stuff? That you're ah, talking? caching. Caching. Yes. Yes. Cool. cool. Yep. Um, so, now, Evan Light asks, um, what's the most memorable or nasty patch that you've made to Ruby or Rails? Memorable or nasty? Uh, um, well, the probably, to be honest, probably the most, I think the nastiest patch I've made, I guess it depends on what you mean by nasty. I'll tell you the one that I think is nastiest, is the, um, the patch that I did for supporting uh, streaming and Rails. And it's not that the patch was, like, the patch was not that big. I mean, it was pretty easy to write. But the convulsions that I had, like the code convulsions that I had to go through in order to get it to work, made me unhappy. So, uh, but we're gonna be like, basically, uh, the new stuff in Rack. The uh, I can't remember what it's called. The I can't remember the name of the API. Hijack API. That's what it is. Mm, mm, yeah. uh, the new high the new Hijack API is basically gonna eliminate all the hacks that I had to do. So, that's gonna go away. Uh, that's the most recent one I can think of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that seems like the hijack API seems like kind of a hack, but I guess it's the only way you can really get around the limitations of Rack itself, isn't it? Yeah, I mean it is. It is kind of. I mean, it's kind of a hack. Yeah, but as far as like, I mean, as far as a stepping stone to something better, I think it's great. I mean, yeah. it'll totally eliminate the crap that I have to do. So, I mean, if I can put like, if I can. If I can push my terrible code onto somebody else, it's always a good day, right? <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were a pass the buck guy. Huh? <laughs> exactly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that actually is an interesting question. I mean, do you think Rails is going to stay on Rack in the future, uh, or is it is Rack kind of limited? Uh, yeah, I think Rails will stay on Rack. I mean, before we had the I had serious doubts about it before we had the hijack APIs, 
Um, but now that we have the hijack APIs, I see no reason to switch. I mean, we can actually iterate on, like, because of that stuff, we can iterate on Rax implementation. I think we can move, uh, basically move to whatever we need to in the future. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think it's going to stay there. Cool, cool. Um, and then Mike Campo actually is ask, asks, where do you see Rails two or three years from now? And if you had control, where would you take it? I see a cat. Oh, yeah, I have two. <laughs> uh, uh, here we go. Cat number one. Uh, <laughs> hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. <laughs> Did we get Gorby Puff? Um, one sec. Okay. Boys and girls, you're going to see a, a wonderful tree. Okay. <laughs> Uh, just a quick reminder, if you're watching, um, please do leave comments and questions uh, either in uh, the YouTube comments or via Twitter on Pound Ruby Hangout, your hashtag Ruby Hangout, sorry, or on IRST on Freeno.net in Pound Ruby Hangout. Not getting him, sorry. Uh, he ran under the bed. It's no good. Yeah, he didn't want to make his appearance for the rest of the world. No, no. <laughs> uh, okay, so Rails in two to three years. Where is it going? Where would I like it to go? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly. Like I think so. I think um, basically, I think clients are going to be getting fatter. I know people are saying like, ah, put everything on the server side and just cache it, super duper cache it. And I think that's going to be scalable to some point. Um, but I think at some point that's going to break down. And we're going to have to go, like, you're basically just buying yourself time, right? It's like, okay, we just keep caching it, caching, 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 caching everything. And I think at some point we're going to hit a limit where it's like, okay, we can't do this anymore. We need to push more calculations to the client side. I think eventually we're going to be um, pushing out those calculate, like pushing out more JavaScript to people, and Rails will become more of an API server. Um, and I think this is, I, I like to... Um, I think this is parallel to, say, PCs, for example. Like, everybody used to use dumb terminals. Like, we used to use dumb terminals, have big mainframes, do all the calculations on the mainframes, and then we found out, well, as computers got cheaper, we could distribute all that stuff to a bunch of different people, and we didn't have to, like, do all the calculations on mainframes, and basically that went away. I mean, even if you look at, like, cash registers now, they're basically PCs. Right, so I think it's going to start moving such that Rails will be more of an API server. I think that's interesting. And do you think it's uh, and just to play devil's advocate a little bit? Do you think maybe that the way we're thinking about that? Because I, I actually think the same myself. But do you think maybe we're thinking that way because of the evolution that we've had in our own personal computers? Like, what if we went back into like oh, there we go. <laughs> Oh, uh, this is this is SeaTac. Yeah, I was gonna say that's not the same cat I'm used to. <laughs> no. And she's extremely upset. She does not like being held. No. Oh. oh, okay. Bye, buddy. SeaTac. <laughs> <laughs> yes, SeaTac. Nice. <laughs> her name. Her full name is SeaTac Airport YouTube. <laughs> sure, you didn't miss one in there. I possibly. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> so I was saying, you know, we went through the whole thin client mainframe, thick yeah. client, like the gaming desktop, you know, and now I think we're kind of trending back towards thin PC, heavy processing on the server again by the web. Um, I could certainly see, you know, the point of, like, if you end up with too much JavaScript on the client and you have relatively thin clients, then maybe they couldn't keep up as much and you'd actually have better performance overall on the server. Or it's maybe the zeitgeist is, I guess, what I'm trying to say might be pushing our thinking this way. Yeah, it's, it's totally possible. I mean, I, like, I am not omniscient. I cannot see the future. But, yeah, I mean, it's totally possible that it's just because of that stuff. I mean, the advantage of, like... Also, the advantage of um, well, we've been we've been doing the I guess skinny clients like skinny browser clients for years, right? But 
the advantage of the skinny clients is that like whenever we push a server update or whenever we push an update to the website, it's immediately updated on everybody. Whereas if we're getting we're sending out fat JavaScript, you know, fat JavaScript applications, maybe that's not the case. Although on the other hand, there's ways to work around that. Just have the JavaScript like re like reload. Like, oh hey, we got a new update, reload, you're good to go. Mm -hmm. So I mean I'm not I don't know. I'm not totally sure. Maybe we'll find something in the middle. Presumably, well, honestly, presumably we'll find we'll have to find something in the middle because even though our Rails servers are still like API servers, you're gonna have to do some kind of rendering, mm -hmm. right? So, I don't think it's gonna be one or the other. It's probably gonna be a mixture of both. Although I think uh, the client side is gonna be getting heavier. So then you think the Rails API project is pretty important? Yeah. Yeah, I guess. Yes, that's really committed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, okay. So, so the thing is, like, Rails API, Rails API is cool. But the thing is, like, uh, you can make your if if you're careful, you can make your Rails application serve up stuff as quickly as Rails API. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, we have like we have a lot of API servers and. Uh, a lot of API servers and mixtures of Sinatra and Rails, uh, and we're not using Rails API, and our Rails servers are fast enough. So I don't know. I mean, so maybe it's fine. Doing then you don't need it, but maybe Rails API gives you a better set of opinions to start with. Yes, yes. If you know that you're building an API server to start out with, like it makes a bunch of the decisions for you. Right, like we, I mean, basically those API servers we have, you had to customize them yourself and be like, okay, like, we need to get rid of these middlewares or, you know, do certain special stuff. So, I mean, I guess it depends on, yeah, I guess it depends on where you are in your project, really, how to choose. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, all right, I want to just kind of move on just a little bit. Um, so what's an average day for you? Wake up, pet the cats, knock out some awesome ass code, and go to sleep? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I guess, um, I don't know. I, tr I work from home every day, but I try to treat it the same as if it was an office job. So, uh, I mean, I'm not wearing any pants right now, but when I work, I'm wearing pants. So... <laughs> not more time. I almost want to call you on that, but uh, I don't want to be called. I don't want to be right. <laughs> no, I mean basically, I just like I don't know. I get up, shower, do all the normal, do all the normal job stuff, and then go to work. And you know, uh, basically, we work on my team. I work from home until lunch, and then I meet. I had there's a couple. I have a couple coworkers here in Seattle. Uh, and then we meet at lunch, and then uh, then we go work from a coffee shop for the rest of the day. And did you travel? You mentioned you travel quite a bit, uh, mostly for conferences, I suppose. Yes, yes, I do. Yeah, so, I have been traveling a bit lately. Those days are different. <laughs> how many conferences have you, or how many talks have you given lately? Uh, this year, I think I've given. Actually, I can tell you exactly. Uh-oh. Uh, muted. There we go. Oh, that's right. You're typing. Google Hangout. Sorry. <laughs> that's cool. I've given... Hold on. Really? That many? Huh. <laughs> I guess... Here. I've given 12 talks this year, apparently. Give or take. A couple, just this, just 2013. Yeah, true. It's like two a month. Huh. Okay, actually, that's not true. I have some. I have some repo for talks. I haven't. I haven't given some of these talks yet. So uh, okay. let's say let's say ten or eight this okay. year. That keeps you pretty busy, I'm sure, too. Yeah, it does. Coding. You got to stop talking and churn out more awesome ass code. Yes. 
Yes, definitely. Absolutely. Actually, that I I like I like programming a lot, but the thing is, like, so let me tell you how I got my job. Uh, got my job being an open source programmer, not job being a programmer. Uh, <laughs> so uh, basically, I uh, I was out with my wife one night. And I just got this job at AT and T. When I first started working at AT and T, I did not do open source software for them. I was just working on Rails applications for them. Uh, but basically, it chewed up a lot of my time that I would had otherwise spent on open source stuff. And I found out that like there are a lot of Rails devs at AT and T, and basically all of them were using open source software that I had written. And I was like, hey, you know. They're using all the software I wrote, but I don't have time to maintain it. I'm out with my wife telling her this, and I'm like, you know, I wish I, I want to be an open source programmer full time. And we were at a bar. We'd had a couple drinks. And I'm like, I want to do open source. And she's like, you should do it. It's like, OK, I'll do it. How do I do it? And then she tells me, you should give a presentation to your boss. <laughs> so I'm like, OK, I'm going to give a presentation to my boss. It's like 11 p.m. on a Friday, so I texted my boss at 11 p.m. I'm like, <laughs> I, I need to talk to you tomorrow. That's Friday. <laughs> <laughs> so he texts me back. He's like, okay, what time? And I'm like, 9 a.m. Like, All right. <laughs> so we go home immediately. I put together, I put together a presentation about like, all the open source stuff that I had done. And basically, if you almost at midnight while you're drunk. Yes, I wasn't drunk. I was a little bit. Otherwise, if I had been drunk, I couldn't have put this together. It was like, <laughs> so so I put it together. I put together slides like basically, you know, this is how I spend my days. I spend my off time doing open source, and these are like basically a few key. I pulled put together a few key metrics. Basically, like. Um, I did X, Y, Z, and that improved the productivity of your developers by so much. You can take that productivity and multiply it out by the number of developers you have. So, like, if I am able to work on this code all day, if I can improve the 50 devs that we have, then it should easily pay for my salary, right? The other thing that I did is, well, the other reason that, the other sales point I used, which comes back to conferences, is basically, like, this is very good publicity. If you want to hire people, like I speak at con I can speak at conferences easily. If you want to hire people, people know me. We can get developers. So that was the that's basically the short term sales tactic. So for other people who want to do open source as a job, your short term sales tactic is advertisement. So I. You, I advertise at conferences. If you need to hire people, I speak at conferences, so I can say like, "Oh, we're hiring." Nice. So, these are the these are the arguments I used with my company. Anyway, I gave a presentation to my boss. <laughs> he 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 calls it. You know, he calls it like 9 a.m. We get on an iChat, and I give it late. I'm like, I'm giving you a talk. I give him the whole talk. I'm like, I want to be a I want to do open source programming all day, and he's like, man, I thought you were going to quit. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, so can I do can I do open source all day? He's like, yes, you can do it. I'm like, <laughs> so, yeah, so then, like, maybe a month or two, a month or two later, I was doing open source full time, and then that's, that's how I did it. <laughs> yeah, he thought, he thought I was going to quit. <laughs> That's basically quitting. I mean, you're not giving them any more value now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, like, I figured, I basically figured, I don't know why why I didn't have this epiphany before. Is like, I mean, you ask your boss, like, if you ask your boss something like this, the worst thing they're going to do is say no. I mean, there's a high probability that they will say no, but they're not going to, like, fire you or anything. You don't have anything to lose by asking. Seriously, like... There, there's nothing to lose. You ask them if you can do this, maybe they say no, and it's like, okay, well, you just move on with your life. But at least you know, you know. And maybe they do say, maybe they say yes, or maybe they say a day a week or whatever. Now you have some time, which before you had zero. Yeah. So there's so much to gain 
I, I'm not sure why I didn't ask this sooner. So that's a good point, though. You made about one day a week. I mean, it doesn't have to be even full time. No, it's, there's there's value in even um, partial contribution. You know, sometimes. So you start. What you do is you start out with full time and then negotiate your wage. <laughs> I need. To, I have to do it full time. Have to do it full time. <laughs> and maybe they'll maybe they'll counter offer with like, okay, how about we'll give you three days a week. <laughs> Four. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. Uh, so, um, I'm gonna wrap up a little bit, uh, but a few more uh, quick ones. Uh, what do you think of Elixir? Um, I think Elixir is off. So does everybody... Let's explain what Elixir is. Yes, let's do that. Thank Elixir you. Elixir is a programming language that whose name I can never spell correctly. <laughs> um, but it's a programming language written by Jose William, and it runs on um, Erlang. So you run your... You compile all of your Elixir stuff, it compiles down to Erlang bytecode and runs on the Erlang VM. Um, and it is a functional, a functional programming language. Um... I think it is very cool. Um, I haven't written anything real with it yet. I haven't written any real applications with it yet. Uh, I don't know what to write with it. And I have to be honest, like the first thing that I did with Elixir was I wrote um, uh, cons, car, cutter, and then wrote my own scheme. So I was like, oh, it's great. It's just like scheme. OK, <laughs> scheme time. <laughs> so. Uh, I don't know. I think it's. I think it's very cool. I think it's an awesome language. I think we'll be seeing. We'll be seeing more of it in the future. I believe. Do you think it's going to take all the Rubyists away from Ruby? Uh, no, probably not. Like, it's. I mean, so one of the things that I love about Ruby and Erlang can't Elixir can't offer this, and Erlang can't offer this is um, that Ruby has a nice. Ruby has a nice mixture of OO and functional. So you can do functional stuff. Like, it's not purely functional. You can do stuff that's not purely functional. Um, and you can, you can do stuff that's purely functional, and you get to choose. I mean, of course, there's, of course there's trade-offs with that. I mean, there's some stuff, like, even though you can do functional stuff in Ruby, because it's not a pure functional language, there's some neat things you can do in functional languages that you can't do in Ruby. Uh, so, I mean, I don't think it's going to take away... I think there's going to be a lot of OO people, OO-minded people who will stick with Ruby. Uh, but if you can wrap your head around functional and do everything functional all the time, probably Elixir would be a good, a good deal. Mm -hmm. I have to say, like, I've tried Erlang and I've tried Elixir, and the syntax for Erlang or for Elixir is just so much better. Like... Yes. I will, like, because of Elixir, I will never write any Erlang. Like, <laughs> I am like... <laughs> I don't know, the, the ending a sentence with a period thing in, in Erlang is always the weirdest thing for me. I don't know why. I think just Erlang just, it just doesn't look very good. I mean, mm. Elixir is like, Elixir is basically the nice syntax of Ruby you know, nice ruby of syntax, but you get also get all the awesome features that uh, that Erlang provides you. So, like uh, CoffeeScript for yes, yes. Although I think Erlang Erlang's a little or Elixir is a bit more sophisticated than CoffeeScript, I think, because uh, I think if I remember correctly, Elixir actually compiles down to Erlang bytecode, where rather than just doing a straight up translation, mm. like like uh, CoffeeScript does. Mm -hmm. But you know what would be cool is if they could run CoffeeScript in the browser. That would be pretty cool. Natively. Can? Yeah, I know, I know, you, I know you can. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, actual browser support would be... Hey, as long as we're doing how about actual browser support for Ruby? Yeah, that's true. That's true. Do you I don't know, I mean... Happen? I don't know. I mean, basically, I write all of my... I still write all of my client-side stuff with Java applets, so... <laughs> <laughs> if you go to my website, there's a lot of MIDI's and, like, you know, Marching. Java stuff. Yep. 
Marquis, you might see the little Netscape logo there. <laughs> Under construction gifts. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Actually, I saw there was a website that was like, what was it called? It was like GeoCities for Bootstrap. Yeah, like Neo Cities or something, wasn't it? Neo, yes, this looks amazing. Like I, I gotta use this. <laughs> yeah, I was looking at that. I was like, "Oh, I'm back!" The internet. That, that should be my pick for today. Is Geo Cities Geo Cities for Bootstrap? <laughs> yes. Okay, that's one of my. Yes, that is one of my picks for today. Okay, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Okay, uh, one more um, uh, quick one. Uh, operating system, uh, OS X, Linux, Windows. Um, I develop mm. on, I develop on OS X, but I've been using like, so. Uh, I guess I have u- I used Linux for about half my career, and then the other half I've been on OS X. Um, but I mean, we like develop on OS X, but deploy to Linux, so. Yeah, I like OS X on the desktop for sure, but I like Linux on the server. Fair enough. How about editor? I use Vim. All right. I can't. So basically, like, I've been using Vim. I've been using Vim since like ninety eight or ninety nine, mm-hmm. and like, I can't switch to anything else. I remember when the uh, TextMate came out, like. My, I was at my Rails job, and everybody's on TextMate, and I'm like, I can't do it. I just can't do it. I can't go to TextMate. <laughs> They're like, why are you using TextMate? It's so much better. It actually, <laughs> that was actually really good for me because I had coworkers. We would do pair programming, right? And my pair would use TextMate, and he could move around so quickly. It forced me to level up my level up my Vim skills so that I could keep up with that. Um, it's actually interesting now. I think more. Pe- I think Vim is now the hip. I think it's the hip editor now. I think. Yeah, I think. Although I don't know, Erlang. Um, Erla- Sublime Text is Emacs. pretty hip. Emacs. Emacs. Emacs is taking over. I think Avdi's okay. pushing the Emacs wave. Eh, I don't <laughs> like Emacs. I'm not really. I'm not really an Emacs guy. My problem with Emacs is you have to play an organ. You need like both feet and like twelve fingers. <laughs> Meta X, Meta C, Meta something, Meta, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. No, my, one of my coworkers is on Emacs, and that's fine. I can't use his computer anyway, though, because he does Dvorak. Mm. Uh, and I use QWERTY. Actually, people are like, you should switch to Dvorak. It's better for your fingers. And i like, I tried switching to Dvorak, and I did it for about 10 minutes until I opened up Vim. And I was like, nope, nope, yeah. not going to relearn all of my, I can't relearn all my Vim stuff. I have no, when I'm working in Vim, I have no idea what letter I'm pressing. No <laughs> idea. It's just like, it's literally just muscle memory. Like, okay, this is where your finger goes. That's where your finger goes. <laughs> and having to relearn that on Dvorak, I would be screwed. Just oh, yeah. couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. <laughs> I'll, st- I'll stick with the carpal tunnel, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> awesome. Well, I think that is it uh, for uh, for time. Uh, really appreciate you uh, you coming on and, and chatting with us. Yeah, thanks for hanging out. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I would I would love to hang out anytime. <laughs> um. Uh... So let's go ahead and go to the picks. Uh, we'll come back to you last, Aaron. Uh, let's see who's up first. Eric, what are your picks tonight? Sure. Um, so my pick tonight is uh, BoConf. Uh, it's uh, B-O-H-C-O-N-F dot com. Um, so I have a little blur about this. Um, Smart Logic is bringing BoConf back to Baltimore as a standalone conference conference on seven nineteen which is next Friday. Uh, listeners can use BO Hangout in all caps, so B-O-H Hangout for 20% off until sales end. Uh, conference has a wider focus than just Ruby, so come and talk to Rubyus and learn about other design and development topics as well. Uh, and then we are at at BoConf on Twitter. Awesome. 
Yeah, so BoConf used to be, what, like the hallway reach back at RailsConf, didn't it? Yeah. And then this year it, uh, for some what for whatever reason, it didn't come back. Um, so we took it back to Baltimore. All right. Definitely, uh, definitely recommend it. Uh, and not only because I live very close by. <laughs> uh, anything else, Eric? Uh, that, that, that's it. All right. Uh, JP, what is what are your picks? Uh, me or the other GP? You, you. You. <laughs> so I guess my picks were uh, Elixir, uh, but uh, Heron talked about it. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's Elixir, <laughs> and <laughs> the other one would be uh, Burlington Ruby Conference, which is the only Ruby Conference near uh, Quebec Province. Uh, so this is something I hope uh, will be really fun. And yeah. What was the name of it again? Burlington Ruby Conference in Vermont. Oh, Burlington, Vermont. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, my accent. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> we have to have a token Frenchman, right? <laughs> uh, so Jim. That... Sorry, go ahead. That's it. All right, Jim, what are your picks? Okay, so I've got just uh, two. One of them self promotion, so I'll wait for that in, in just a second. But um, first one is uh, Pair Program with Me, the uh, hashtag on Twitter. And uh, the pair program with dot me website that um, Omni Grimm put together and a bunch of the parlays parlayers put together. So um, I've been doing a lot of uh, remote pair programming, being mentored and trying to mentor. And um, one of the greatest things I've done since I've got into the Ruby community. So um, definitely want to plug that. And how, how does that work? Well, um, you you tweet out um, your hashtag pair program with me and. A couple of people will come back with, uh, yeah, I'll pair with you, and you set up a time, and you, you know, I've got, for me personally, I've got a, a EC2 server we all secure shell into and, and work on a project together, so. Um, I, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm actually giving a talk on it at the uh, GNO Code tomorrow, which is the Greater New Orleans area uh, meetup. Are and there any so instructions? That, that's, uh, Are there any instructions? Yeah, I was wondering if there's any instructions for getting an EC2 instance set up for doing pairing. There, there, there is. Um, if you go to pair program dot or pro, pair program with dot me, there's um, uh, links to different ones, um, and there is an actual guide to setting up an e EC2 instance. Um, uh, unfortunately, I, I didn't have that guide when I did it, but um, it, it was it, it was a little bit of hassle, but um, it, it's not too bad. And nice. um, so um, my other pick, and this is the, the self self promotion deal, but um, I'm putting together a thing the day before RubyConf. Um, it's uh, Ruby on Sales, and you can find out about it at Ruby on Sales with an S A I L S um, dot info. And um, I, I'm I'm looking for sponsors, by the way. I've got I've got two, and I should guess I that I should um, give a shout out to. Um, first up was HashRocket. They um, were the, the the first big sponsor we had and uh, Darkyard. So um, please come check it out. We're gonna go sail, have a great day the day before RubyConf kicks off, um, and, and should be fairly cheap and a lot of fun. Sailing in sailboats. Yes. Um, yeah. Leave your chargers and laptops behind. It's gonna be six people per boat. You know, real intimate setting. You can actually get what you would normally get on a hallway track. So um, and forced with it for four hours. Oh, and I guess I should mention uh, you know, the whole harassment policy. Um, walk the plank. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Uh, all right, I'll go ahead and go. Uh, so my picks, uh, my first pick is uh, actually Aaron's Enterprise Gem. If you haven't checked it out, you really need to. I think it's going to change your life. Uh, so definitely go check that out. Uh, my uh, my second pick is uh, uh, also kind of in the theme of, of whimsy here, since we got Aaron on uh, Cornify. If you haven't Cornified uh, a website yet, um, it's uh, what is it? Cornify.com, like C-O-R-N-I-F-Y. Definitely, also want to check that one out. Uh, and my last pick is go take a vacation. I just did, and it was really, really great. I haven't had a vacation in like. A year and a half, and I really needed it. So go, make sure you take a vacation, 
you need to have one at least every year. Take a week off. You're going to be much better at your job, and you're going to love life a lot better. So, uh, Aaron, what are your picks? Uh, well, with Ruby on sales, I recommend that you take a knot tying course. <laughs> It'll probably be good to know how to tie knots. Um, so I guess my other picks would be uh, what were we whoa, what were we talking about the um, GeoCities thing, which you will have to Google GeoCities with Bootstrap. Um, and my other picks are I've been playing with uh, Leap. Motion recently, which is this thing, this hardware thing that that detects your fingers in 3D space. Let me show you. Have it here. It's this, uh -huh. and you set it in front of your computer, and it detects where your fingers are and feeds that back to your computer, so you can do stuff, do stuff with it. So it gives you finger locations in a 3D plane, so it's you like can. It's like a USB theremin. Yes, you can build a theremin. They have they actually have one of one of the sample apps is building a theremin with it. It's kind of cool. It'll it'll open up like a web socket on your machine so you can uh, process all the stuff in a browser, like process all the give you a bunch of JSON events in the browser and process them. Um, and the other thing I want to pick and recommend is a book called um, Charcuterie by Rollman, Michael Rollman. I think his first name is Michael Rollman. Um, and it is a book about curing meats. Well, not just, like, it's not just curing meats. I recommend it for anybody who likes cooking. I love cooking. I recommend this book. It's got stuff about making sausages, bacon, curing meats, bunch of recipes. It's just, like, every recipe I've used is super delicious, so I highly recommend it. I had some of your salami at uh, RubyConf, and it was extremely tasty, so I highly recommend it. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, thanks again. Really appreciate you coming on. Um, for everybody else, uh, you know, this is a meetup. The best part of the meetup, I think, is the after the meetup, where you go to the bar and you hang out and you make some friends and chat and geek out for a while. So we do that. Uh, and the way we do that is by public Google Hangouts. So what I'm going to do here in just a moment is put on Google Plus page and on Twitter and in YouTube and IRC, all these places, a link to the um, Google spreadsheet where you can come in and find a link to a public Hangout and join it. Uh, if we run out of slots, like you can only fit 10 people in a Hangout, um, definitely create another Hangout, just make it public, uh, copy and paste the URL into the document. It's all really editable so that people can join you. So, I uh, don't know if Aaron has time or not to join us. Uh, I would love it if you could. Obviously, if you can, that's not a big deal. Uh, I'm sure I will be there for a while, and as long, along with, uh, I'm sure, some of these other moderators and everybody else from the community. So, uh, please join us. Uh, again, just look uh, in the, uh, the various places for the link. Thanks very much. Uh, next month, Jim Gay talking about dun 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 DCI and how he has done it or not. <laughs> uh, he has a book out if you want to read it ahead of time. It's clean ruby.com, I think it is. Uh, so check it out. All right. See you all. Thanks again, Aaron. Bye. Thank you.